Hey, good evening. Uh, thank you for being here this evening. Um, just want to remind you to, uh, if you got a device, go ahead and silence it or turn it off. Um, I have my mask on just because I'm speaking, but it reminds you that your masks are expected to be worn during this time. That's part of our policy here at uh, Bellman. Um, and we'll start off with uh, our prayer. This is a prayer for our seniors. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before you even formed, God knew you. While in your mother's womb, God named you. At your birth, God's breath filled you with life. Today we celebrate what you have become and are becoming at this moment in time. And so we pray. God of our beginnings, we thank you for the gifts of these senior presenters, their excitement, their awesome wonder and curiosity, their open speech and encouraging words. Their contributions have blessed and challenged us, and we have become a richer and more diverse community because of them. As they step forward into the world that awaits, comfort their fears with the full knowledge of your divine presence. Strengthen their resolve to walk in the footsteps of Jesus as modern day disciples in a world that needs their spirit. Guide their feet as they move through life, protecting them from the pitfalls of darkness while they help to lead future generations into the warmth and promise of your light. We ask this blessing upon each of our seniors, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Satan Robert Bellman. Thank you. Um, well, this is uh, the front and back of our pro program for today. Um, and I just want to start off real quickly with uh, a few thanks. Um, they'll be using, they'll be talking about their projects and using I, and sometimes we as well. Um, but a lot of people involved um, in helping them out, some pretty complex stuff. And so we have a list of uh, some of the mentors from various places. Um, so I'd actually just like to give you a, um, applause for those folks. I don't know if any of those um, people are here this evening, but um, they might be joining us also through streaming. And we are streaming this um, through our YouTube channel. Um, and so if there's any part of this that you want and need to see again, uh, there'll be a link to this. Um, freshmen and sophomores, you know you have an assignment, right? So make certain you take copious notes. Um, and those will be due next week, and then the evaluation piece the following week. Um, any, uh, anyone not seeing freshmen and sophomores doing their job, please give them a little push forward, okay? Um, and uh, also, I want to thank uh, our digital services folks um, for setting this up, too, and, and providing the stream. Um, so the way it's going to work, we, got, we have uh, several presenters this evening. Um, they, students have finished uh, their, for the most part, the research paper. Um, they've submitted them to the Junior Science and Humanities Symposium. Um, and hopefully in, in eight days we'll find out uh, that there's a few of us get to present at this symposium that happens in uh, mid-February this month. Um, with that in mind, we use their format for this presentation. Um, so we've worked pretty hard to get them down to 12 minutes from, in some cases, like 25. I guess they have a lot to say. Um, and there will be uh, a questions, uh, and a question and answer session afterwards. Um, as far as questions are concerned, if you could, um, so we can hear you, if you could stand up and just ask your question, and then the students will repeat the questions um, and give it their best shot in trying to answer them. So, um, so and the uh, last piece is we're going to kind of be going through, we'll take a couple of um, sort of stretch breaks, um, but we're going to try to uh, kind of power through this um, and uh, um, give us time to be able to, like, like I said, to present and be able to answer some questions. So, um, And they will be presenting or uh, uh, introducing themselves. So my time is up here, and I'm going to go ahead and get uh, off the stage. And we're going to start off, I believe, with Jalen Shawcross.
Hello. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jalen Shawcross. And today, I'm going to be talking about modeling nitrogen isotope fractionation in nitrate deposition on early Mars. That's right, buckle your seatbelts, because not only are we going to space, we're also going back in time to discuss the abundance of nitrogen on early Mars. In the background, we see an artist's rendition of what early Mars may have looked like. It was likely warm and wet with resembling Earth. It may have had liquid water, an abundance of nitrogen, and many of the other chemicals necessary to sustain life. Why specifically nitrogen? Well, it's useful in the prebiotic soup, in DNA, proteins, amino acids, and any of the other chemicals essential for life. It makes up about 2.6% of the Mars atmosphere and is influenced by many processes, including lightning, photochemistry, and more. One of the phenomena that occurs with nitrogen is fractionation, where isotopes separate out on the basis of weight. There are two stable isotopes of nitrogen, nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15. Nitrogen-15 makes up much less of the nitrogen on Mars than nitrogen-14 and is slightly heavier with one additional neutron in its nucleus. At different altitudes, the isotopic ratios of nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15 differ, and that can give insight into the fractionation caused by planetary processes like lightning and photochemistry. Another phenomena that occurs is nitrate deposition, where nitrogen species will collect onto the ground. Nitrogen oxides, or NOx, as you'll hear me refer to them for the remainder of this presentation, are essential to early metabolisms. They could have provided the free energy pathway for the first metabolisms, as well as acted as a high potential electron acceptor for early life. So those are the main focus of our study. The question I hope to answer is how and when did NOx deposition occur on Mars? To understand that, we need to understand the process of nitrogen fixation. Diatomic nitrogen, N2, is unusable by most life. So it needs to be converted to other species like NOx and HCN via fixation. Lightning and solar energetic particle events, or SEPs, cause fixation. And we see a diagram showing the processes by which that occurs here. Diatomic nitrogen is split apart by lightning, which reacts with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to form NOx. The NOx then reacts with hydrogen oxides in the atmosphere, forming HNOx, which collects in clouds, precipitates out, then the water evaporates from surface NOx left by rain, and leaves NOx deposition. Solar energetic particles are another means of splitting apart the nitrogen to allow it to react with other gases like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The sun emits high energy particles like photons, protons, and electrons, which collide with diatomic nitrogen in the atmosphere, splitting it off and allowing it to react with these other gases to form NOx. While we're trying to get nitrogen down to the surface of the planet, nitrogen is also being lost to space. The background shows how a magnetic field protects a planet from the harmful effects of the solar wind, but the Mars magnetic field switched off around 4 billion years ago. So solar wind, essentially just protons that carry momentum smacking into the Mars atmosphere and shooting it off, is able to be stripped away. Photochemical effects like that, as well as rays from the sun, which provide the energy for chemical reactions to occur, and the previously mentioned solar energetic particles, are responsible for nitrogen's loss to space. One of the key reactions in this process is dissociative recombination of nitrogen, where N2 is struck and splits off to form two separate nitrogen atoms, both of which will usually either escape to space or, less frequently, react with other gases in the atmosphere to form the other species. Here is a cartoon showing some of the many reactions that dominate nitrogen chemistry, as well as processes such as rain out and lightning. This current snapshot is from 4 to 3.7 billion, billion years ago which is the time frame that I consider in my model. To conduct this study, I used the Caltech and NASA JPL kinetics 1D photochemical and transport model. I modified the model to include nitrogen-15 as an isotope, and this was the first study to include nitrogen isotope chemistry in kinetics. The background here is several of the lines of code that we used in our kinetics model. I duplicated each of the 14 in species and reactions to include a nitrogen-15 version, 
as well as it changed the mass of nitrogen-15 to better reflect its mass for fractionation. I adjusted the ionization potential, or the energy required to split into, to more accurately have the correct SEP rate for fixation, and changed the photolysis cross-sections. Essentially, nitrogen-15, consisting of one extra neutron in its nucleus, is larger than nitrogen-14, so it has a greater target area for solar energetic particles to split it apart. This, okay, here we go. I considered two atmospheres, an early one bar carbon dioxide dominated atmosphere on Mars, as well as a modern seven millibar carbon dioxide oxidizing Martian atmosphere. On the early Mars, I assumed a background nitrogen ratio of one nitrogen 15 per 270 nitrogen 14, which is consistent with existing literature determining the nitrogen isotopic ratio in the primordial solar system. During the modern simulation, I assumed a background nitrogen isotope ratio of 1,15 in to 173,15 in, as found by the Curiosity rover. So, here are some results. Don't worry, I'll, I'll explain them nice and simple. Each of the lines shows a specific graph, shows a specific species mixing ratio, which is just the concentration of the gas in the Mars atmosphere as altitude increases. So for example, we see nitrogen oxide, this pink line here, is usually somewhere between 10 to the negative 10th and 10 to the negative 8th percent of the Mars atmosphere. The A inversions, the dotted lines, correspond to nitrogen 15, while the solid lines correspond to nitrogen 14. And this shows the relative abundance of each gas in the Mars atmosphere. This is great and all well and good, but it doesn't actually tell us about how the ratios compare to each other. So we can divide them and generate one of these handy graphs here. Here we see that nitrogen oxides exist in less than the background nitrogen isotopic ratio on Mars, which is brand new information. The black line plotted here is at that assumed 1 over 270 background nitrogen isotope ratio. And we see consistently less than a 1 over 270 ratio. The cyan line is nitrogen 2D, an excited form of nitrogen, which is formed when solar energetic particles split diatomic nitrogen and in that dissociative recombination reaction. It's at that consistent value, which is the 1 over 270, scaled by the ionization potential, while up at the top here, we see that solar energetic particles are consistently forming these nitrogen species because they take on the rate of the N2D formation. At the bottom, the isotopic ratio is more similar to that 1 over 270, which means that they're likely formed by lightning, as lightning does not fractionate the isotopes on Mars. Now for the modern Mars graphs, we see as altitude increases, nitrogen is more abundant than in the previous early Mars, as well as just generally uh, consistent with the 1 over 173 ratio that Curiosity rover, as well as the MAVEN orbiter, have established for the modern day Mars. But when we divide, we see again that nitrogen isotopes in nitrogen oxides are depleted relative to the background abundance. This black line here is plotted at 17, over 173, which is the assumed background isotopic ratio of modern day Mars. Here we see the N2D does not start forming until around 100 kilometers, which is to be expected given that the solar energetic particles don't penetrate that deep below the 100 kilometer mark. We see as altitude increases, that solar energetic particles become responsible for a majority of the formation of these nitrogen oxides because the rate of all of the other nitrogen oxides takes on the rate of that N2D formation. So our long-term objective then is to model the entire history of nitrogen isotope evolution on Mars. 
Mars is divided between many different eras, and I've just shown the Noachian era. But there's other areas like the Hesperian and the Amazonian era that are characterized by different processes, like volcanic outgassing, more liquid water activity, etc. And I plan to integrate all of the nitrate deposition and nitrate loss from Mars through all of time, varying the initial conditions as I go along, to then hope to find a model that matches up with the ratios observed on present day Mars, and will have then found a set of initial conditions to successfully explain the entire evolution of nitrogen on Mars. Our knowledge of present comes from the MAVEN orbiter around Mars, as well as the Mars Science Laboratory, or Curiosity rover. I also intend to add more species to the model, including ammonia, um, nitrile, as well as many others. And this is just to give a greater understanding of the true history of all of nitrogen. One of the most important results from our, my study was that nitrogen oxide nitrogen isotope ratios are depleted relative to the background atmosphere. A future Mars rover can observe the isotopic ratios in the nitrate deposits found in Gale Crater. And if they find less nitrogen-15 than what our model predicts, that might point towards another formation process occurring that our model does not include. Now, once we've included sputtering and ion loss into the model, that leaves the only source of nitrogen fixation as biologically induced. So, if that Mars rover were to find less than this study, biologically induced nitrogen fixation is responsible for depletion of nitrogen isotopes, which could be an indicator of life on early Mars. I'd like to give a huge thank you to my parents and brother, as well as the Marine Chem class of 2022, and especially Van TSN 292, Mr. DeGro and the Nielsens, as well as everybody from the research group, Professor Young, Kayla Smith, and Maddie Christensen, who was the first person to introduce me to this project. And I cannot give a large enough thank you to my mentors, Mike Wong and Danica Adams, who have been with me every step of the way through this project, meeting with me every week, sometimes multiple times a week for the past 10 months, and have shown me not just the type of scientist, but also the type of person I want to be. have some references, and I will now take any questions. Feel free to ask me to return to any particular slide or anything about the project, Mars, my results. Um, can you repeat the question? Maybe pull the mask down. Ah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the question was, what do I want to be when I grow up? And <laughs> to be honest, there's a lot of good answers to that. Um, at present, I intend to be an aerospace engineer, hopefully working with NASA JPL on designing, actually, missions to Mars, maybe one of which can help to verify the results of this study although I'm considering several other space-related paths to my career as well. Any other questions for anyone? All right. Thank you. Hello everyone, um, my name is Hannah Gray uh, and I compared the efficacy of surgical masks 
inside versus outside through the quantification of bacterial growth. So first things first, what is SARS-CoV-2? So SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that's more commonly known as COVID-19. Um, it's a virus that descends from a lineage of viruses known as the coronaviruses. Um, in most cases, the virus causes symptoms similar to those of the common cold or the, the influenza. However, past experiences from the SARS epidemic in 2003 and the MERS epidemic in 2012 show that symptoms can be much more severe. Over the course of the pandemic, there have been over 380 million diagnosed cases globally, with just over 70 million in the U.S. alone. Although the virus is highly contagious, preventative measures can be taken to reduce transmission. Research shows that properly wearing surgical masks uh, and multi-layer cloth masks is one of the best preventative measures to avoid contracting or transmitting the virus. So COVID-19 is an airborne illness that transmits through the respiratory system in the form of aerosols. Aerosols are a small liquid particle containing bacteria and viruses. Aerosols range in size and on average are between 5 to 10 micrometers. To put this into perspective, the average grain of sand is about 60 micrometers in diameter. Now these aerosols can travel up to 6 feet and can remain suspended in air for hours at a time. However, ventilation does impact the distance traveled and the time length of suspension. Unlike bacteria, viruses cannot be grown on agar petri dishes. Instead, they have to be cultured inside of host cells, and it wasn't a procedure that could be easily replicated with the equipment available to me. Uh, with this in mind and the fact that respiratory viruses transmit similarly to bacterial diseases through aerosols, I chose to design a study that would analyze and compare bacterial growth. So why surgical masks? So with the cases of Omicron surging, the CDC and World Health Organization are urging people to start using medical grade uh, masks such as surgical masks, N95s, and KN95s. Cloth masks are still effective, although multi-layer cloth masks are much more effective than single layer cloth masks. In a study conducted in August of 2021, researchers from Yale, Stanford, Johns Hopkins University, University of California, Berkeley, and others found that properly worn surgical masks were 95% more effective at filtering out viral particles in comparison to the 37% effectiveness of properly worn single layer cloth masks. I chose to use surgical masks because it was too expensive to buy new cloth masks to maintain the quality of newness that each of the cloth masks required for each trial. Uh, it also would have been unethical for me to have my participants rewear soiled masks. Uh, because of this and because of the CDC and World Health Organization recommendation, I chose to study the efficacy of different mask wearing variations of surgical masks. So wearing masks properly is vital to reducing transmission of airborne particles in the aerosols. Some common ways of improperly wearing masks are underneath the nose, underneath the nose and the mouth, wearing a mask that is too big for the face, and wearing a mask above the chin. So in the picture, uh, the, the diagrams on the left show the improper ways to wear a mask underneath the nose and the mouth, underneath the nose, gaps in the mask. Um, and then on the right, there's pictures where the woman is wearing the mask properly, where there are no gaps, and the mask is securely worn over the nose and the mouth. So there's research indicating that properly worn masks are effective at reducing transmission, and there's also research that indicates that not wearing a mask at all increases transmission, but there's less research on how effective improperly worn masks are at reducing transmission. Which brings me to my problem. How much does the efficacy of surgical masks change if worn improperly, and does efficacy vary by location? To test the effectiveness of the surgical masks, I, te I had tested on five volunteers. I tested four variables, action, distance, location, and mask variation. So for both the action and distance procedure, I had the tester wear each of the mask variations above. So a surgical mask, um, which was where the mask was worn properly over the nose and the mouth. Um, no nose, where the mask was worn underneath the nose. Um, and no mask, where there was no mask used at all. And for the action procedure, I instructed the tester to sink for a minute into a petri dish that was held arm's length away from the face. Um, I had them read a book for one minute into a petri dish held arm's length away, 
and I had them cough twice into a petri dish held arm's length away from the face. Now, I use sheep's blood agar as my medium because of its non-selective growth properties. Nutrient agar is more selective in what types of bacteria grow, and while I'm not analyzing the type of bacteria, I wanted to use a medium that would provide me with the most similar results that would occur in the real world. I also repeated this action procedure outside with the same parameters. In total, there were nine petri dishes for the inside action section and nine petri dishes for the outside action section. So accounting for both the inside and the outside locations, the action section required 18 petri dishes. Going into the second half of the procedure, I tested the distance section. To do this, I labeled a piece of tissue paper with two feet, four feet, and six feet and placed the respective petri dishes at the three distances away from the tester. Um, the tester was then instructed to cough for 15 seconds. This procedure was repeated for each mask variation. The procedure was also repeated outside with the same conditions. After the tests were conducted, the petri dishes were put into an incubator that held a temperature of 36.6 degrees Celsius. The plates stayed in the incubator for two days. There were a total of 18 petri dishes used for the inside and outside distance section. Uh, so accounting for the, all areas of the study, action, and distance, each tester used a total of 36 petri dishes. So I wanted to show this picture of um, one of the sets that I tested um, during the analysis process. So I chose this set uh, because the bacteria is clearly defined and because the, of the presence of fungi, which can be better seen in the picture on the right. So these bacteria colonies, these smaller white ones, are bacteria, but these beige um, growth right here is fungi, um, which is an indicator of environmental contamination. So I divided my data into three graphs. The first one I did was inside versus outside. So first off, I was surprised to see that there wasn't that much difference between growth inside and outside for the no nose and surgical ca categories. The data varied for the no mask section, however. So um, the levels on the no nose and the surgical were very similar. Um, the largest amount of growth was found on the no mask bacteria cultures. For the improperly worn surgical mask, which was my no-nose category, there was less variation in the amount of growth, but there was more growth overall in this category in comparison to the properly worn surgical mask. I used a box and whisker graph to show the range of variation um, for the no-mask category. I wanted to show the variation in data, but since the growth mostly stayed under 10 bacterial colonies, uh, setting the y value to, or the y-axis to a value of 178, which was my highest growth count, would not have shown the variation in the rest of the data. This growth suggests that efficacy depends more on mask wearing variation than location, as originally thought. For the second set of graphs, I graphed the distance. Um, on this slide, like the previous, the amount of growth changes based on the mask type. I also set the range of my y-axis to a smaller value to show the variation in the majority of my data. The no mask variation had the most amount of growth, and it also had the largest amount of variation with the handheld distance having most growth out of all the distances. For the no-nos, there wasn't a distance that had the most growth. The amount of growth was very similar at two feet, four feet, and six feet. For the, the surgical mask category, there is less growth overall um, in comparison to my two other categories. For the surgical mask group, there was more variation than in the no-nos category. Uh, but like the no-nose category, the growth at all of the distances was pretty similar. So the growth patterns indicate that the mask variation affected growth more than the distance. Um, I categorized this graph by action. So I didn't find that there is a clear action that consistently yielded the most growth. Um, however, for the action variable, the highest amount of growth was found on the no-mask petri dishes. Um, the category had the most variation with some petri dishes exceeding 150 bacterial colonies. In the no-nos category, there's less variation across the action types, but more growth overall in comparison to the surgical mask variation. The action that had the highest levels of transmission with no mask were singing and coughing, although the levels of transmission were significantly reduced when wearing a surgical mask, both improperly and properly. Data shows that surgical masks, even worn improperly, significantly reduce transmission. So to test if my results were sig statistically significant, I calculated the p-value. The p-value measures the probability that an observed difference could have occurred by random chance. 
the lower the p-value, the greater the statistical significance of the data. So I set my p-value to 0 0.05, which is standard for the type of study that I'm conducting. Um, if, I, if my p-value is below 0 0.05, I have to reject my null hypothesis. Um, and if my p-value is above 0 0.05, I have to accept um, the null hypothesis and reject the alternative hypothesis. So my null hypothesis was that the mask was not effective at reducing transmission, and my alternative hypothesis was that the mask was effective at reducing transmission. The p-value for the properly worn surgical mask was above 0 0.05, so I had to accept the null hypothesis that the mask was effective at reducing transmission and reject the alternative hypothesis. The p-values for the improperly worn mask and the no mask were below 0 0.05, so I had to reject my null hypothesis that they were effective and accept the alternative hypothesis that they were not effective. So to ensure that bacteria growing on the petri dishes was from a human source, I exposed three blank petri dishes outside and three blank petri dishes inside um, to measure the growth of bacteria from the environment without human contamination. All the growth is fungal growth, which is an indicator of environmental contamination and not human contamination. So as calculated through the p-value, the data I found through this experiment was statistically significant. Um, as expected, the improperly worn surgical mask was less effective at reducing transmission. However, efficacy was not significantly impacted by location. The growth on the no-nos, which was the improperly worn surgical mask um, plates from inside was comparable to the outside petri dishes from the same category. The same can be said for the surgical mask category. The, eff the efficacy of properly and improperly worn surgical masks was not heavily impacted by location, but by the mask wearing variation. In the distance section, the growth patterns indicate that the mask variation affected growth more than distance. And in the action section, the data suggests that the surgical masks, even if worn improperly, significantly reduced transmission. While improperly worn surgical masks are not the best option, um, the data shows that they are still significantly more effective at reducing transmission than not wearing a mask at all. So some variables that could have affected my study are the wind and weather. I tried to maintain the same conditions for each trial just to keep um, all the variables the same. Um, I tested in different temperatures and that might have had an impact on my experiment. I tested across the span of like seven months. So that could have been um, a possible um, variable, but I don't think it was because um, I did incubate all of the petri dishes at the same temperature of 36.6 degrees Celsius um, for two days. So for future tests, um, the possible option could be comparing the efficacy of surgical masks to N95s or KN95s um, and studying that to infiltration abilities of N95 surgical masks, KN95s or others. So here are my sources. And lastly, a big thank you to my mentor, Dr. Stafford, my family for supporting me through this process, Mr. DeGroat and Mr. Nielsen, and the entire Marine Chem class. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, could I control the ventilation from the inside? So um, I couldn't control the ventilation from the inside, but the ventilation in the system um, was a standard ventilation system used in most buildings. Um, I didn't want to test without ventilation because I wanted to create the realest conditions as possible. If I turned that off or even adjusted it so it was higher, then that might give me um, a different result that wouldn't be as like similar to the real world. Yes. Sorry, could you repeat that again? I couldn't hear you. A, a chi chi square. Um, I considered that, but I was um, consulting with one of my stats teachers and also the doctor that I was working with. 
um, and they were having me use a prop Z test to calculate my p-values just because my data was able to fit that. Um, and it, it was one of the more practical ways that I could determine the um, statistical significance of my data. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. All right, there we go. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a little bit different on this end. Uh, so my name is Samuel Abraham, and today I will be discussing the development and optimization of a loop-mediated isothermal amplification assay for cryptosporidium parvum. Mouthful. Cryptosporidium parvum, or crypto, is a parasitic protozoan that causes cryptosporidiosis in mammals. Symptoms most frequently include diarrhea and can lead to dehydration and hospitalization of immunocompromised individuals. Crypto is usually waterborne but can also be spread through uh, food and fecal matter. Crypto is particularly dangerous because it can survive in drinking water despite treatment and as few as 10 parasites is sufficient to cause disease. Furthermore, there are an estimated 748,000 cases of cryptosporidiosis per year. Concerningly, Becker et al. noted an association between food inadequacy, among other things, and infection. In turn, quick, consistent, and cheap identification of this disease in stool samples and water supplies can mean the difference between life and death for poverty-ridden areas with insufficient sanitation. When it comes to or the detection of crypto, there are a few different methods, but here we have three most common methods of detection. Microscopy is the gold standard for detection. The person of the microscope will literally see the parasite under the microscope. There isn't a chance of a false positive. Microscopy's problem is that it requires a person to manually look at the sample in the lab, and only an expert can properly identify the organisms. On the other hand, there is polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. PCR is basically artificial DNA replication. PCR is less labor intensive, but still demands a lot of time, upwards of three hours and special equipment to conduct the reaction, which can only be found in a lab. Finally, we come to loop-mediated isothermal amplification, or LAMP. Surprise, surprise, I did not do my marine chem project on table lamps. LAMP is far more specific about what part of the DNA sequence needs to be replicated. Furthermore, the LAMP method forms a special dumbbell shape, resulting in the production of large amounts of DNA quickly. Additionally, LAMP is isothermal, meaning that the reaction all occurs at one temperature. No fancy equipment needed. LAMP can be performed in the field using a water bath. There has been some research in the past to develop a LAMP assay for crypto. Multiple authors have published papers using different LAMP assays using various methods, but two particular detection methods stand out. Real-time fluorescence and chlorometric. Real-time fluorescence involves the reaction glowing in a quantifiable manner uh, when the DNA amplifies the machine monitors seen in the top picture. In contrast, the calorimetric method involves the solution changing colors, often from pink to yellow, uh, in a tube that contains the correct DNA. The real-time method is much more useful in a lab setting, but requires some level of expertise, while the calorimetric method is extremely simple and takes no expertise at all. Even I can do it. I decided to study these two methods and decided to base our experiment off a study conducted by Ravindran et al., where variables were modified to improve the time to amplification and the sensitivity of the primers. So my goal was to optimize a calorimetric and real-time fluorescence lamp assay for cryptosporidium parvum. So uh, a basic overview of lamp. In a given sample, there might be cryptosporidium DNA. Lamp is basically artificial DNA replication. If the DNA is in the sample, the DNA replicates, and we know that the poop has crypto in it. Primers tell a molecule called DNA polymerase where to start replicating. They're like little scouts that find a section of the DNA to attach to and allow the replication to begin. Primers come in sets that work in tandem to produce replication. LAMP primer sets ideally include six primers. 
Often different research studies will design different sets of primers for the same organism. Uh, I decided to design our own primers, the SA primers, using the 18S region of the DNA sequence. I produced six primers and used Thermo Fisher's multiple primer analyzer tool to evaluate how well they would work and to find the optimal conditions for their use. So those, uh, those six things are the primers I produced. And they're named after me, which is kind of cool. Uh, so the goal of optimization is making the reaction as fast as possible, consistent as possible, and cheap as possible. Here my experiment diverges into the optimization of two different lamp reactions. My first goal was to, er, first fluorescence. My first goal was to produce a master mix made up from scratch. A master mix is kind of like a chemical soup uh, that the DNA and the primers are in. So the DNA will amplify with the primers if it's heated up, but the master mix makes that amplification visible to our eyes. Master mixes are available commercially, but they tend to be expensive. So I set out to make a master mix from scratch that was cheaper. I also hope to test the efficacy of the SA primer set, which I produced um, against the primer set in, that's been used in the past, the Bakit primer set. Finally, I decided to alter the concentrations of certain components in the master mix to investigate which concentrations uh, help the experiment go faster. I altered the concentration of the primers in the reaction and tested the efficacy of a chemical called betaine. Here, my goals are a little bit different. No one has ever published a calorimetric lamp assay for crypto. So the first goal was to validate the primers and show that they actually worked. From there, I decided to test the efficacy of a 95 degrees Celsius denaturation step that Watts et al. reported to improve amplification. And finally, I set out to produce another scratch master mix. So here's the amplification of the commercial master mix uh, versus the scratch master mix. So in both of these, the red line should increase because it's been spiked with um, cryptosporidium, while the blue lines should remain constant and flat. Note here that the red line of the scratch graph had an extremely high amplification compared to the commercial graph, but the scratch's blue lines also have amplification. Not good. Uh, here I tested three different primer sets against each other. The SAV1 primer set, which I showed you earlier, the SA4T, primer set, which has a small modification, and the primer set used by Bakhit et al. If you look at the top row, you can see the words OSIST, spike stool, stool, and water. The first two, OSIST and spiked stool, should both be positive. They have crypto DNA in them. The second two rows, unspiked stool and water, should have zero amplification. They have no DNA in them. Notably, both of the SA primer sets only amplified one half of the time, while the Bakhit primer sets never amplified. Having found the prim SA primer set to be best, I tested two different primer concentrations, SA106 and SA107. SA106 follows published primer concentrations that have been used by many other studies in the past, while SA107 is a novel concentration that we came up with in the lab. So as you can see here, SA106, the blue line amplifies, and SA107 doesn't, uh, so essentially failing. From there, I tested the chemical betaine. I tested betaine on both the commercial master mix and the scratch master mix. Note that the commercial master mix did not have strong amplification, while the scratch master mix had amplification of one half of the positive samples, that red line, but no amplification of the negative samples. So now onto the calorimetric part. Firstly, I was able to validate the calorimetric assay. All of the yellow samples are positive, they're supposed to be, and all of the red were negative, so the assay primers at the minimum were working correctly. Next, I tested the efficacy of the 95 degrees Celsius denaturation step. So there are some signs of weak amplification in the 95 degrees Celsius part. Uh, you can see that um, in the shift to kind of pinkish yellow, but it's unclear. Uh, and you can see clear amplification on the right in the, uh, one of the 65 degrees Celsius positive tubes. We also were able to produce a scratch calorimetric master mix using malachite green dye, which is nearly identical to the fluorescent scratch master mix. And so uh, we are able to see some amplification. For here, it goes from light blue to darker blue, reliably up to a 1 to 100 dilution. And here's the final product. So these are the compositions of the scratch master mixes for a real-time fluorescence and calorimetric assay. The point of this is it's something of a recipe for future studies to use or improve upon when they're trying to detect crypto. So just a little overview of what we're going to talk about. So the study should be considered a success. At the minimum, we produced functioning primers and a scratch master mix. As I noted, the fluorescent scratch samples did have false amplification. That's what's happening with the blue lines over around 42 minutes. Uh, a potential solution to this could be incubating the samples for no longer than 30 minutes. 
Attempts to replicate my results would be appropriate, as I cannot definitively say that the Scratch Master Mix is better than the commercial one. The commercial Master Mix did appear to have trouble producing any sort of amplification throughout the study. This might be due to the age of the Master Mix. The same Master Mix had been used for an extended period of time. Notably, the SA primer set did work best, but it only ever appeared to work one half of the time. This consistency isn't particularly impressive, and further research should be done en masse to discover the actual consistency of the primer set. Furthermore, the addition of a quadruple thiamine spacer, the SA4T set, did not improve the functionality of the primer set as described by Tune et al. Also, we can see in the test of Bakit primers, they didn't produce any results. Uh, however, we think this might not be the fault of the primer, but the type of DNA used. The cows from whom the University of Arizona acquired the OSIS carry the Iowa strain of Cryptosporidium parvum, potentially resulting in the primers failing, but also signifying that Bakit's primers don't work for the Iowa strain. So in this graph, you can see that the blue line increases, again, showing well amplification, the red does not. So the blue line is uh, our 106, the published concentration, red line is um, our experimental. So while it does appear that this is a failure, it might just indicate that the appropriate primer concentration for a lamp uh, reaction depends on the type of assay conducted. Because we used 106 here for, for a fluorescence assay, while we used 107 for a calorimetric assay. And it worked up to a 1 to 100 dilution. So the tests of betaine were inconclusive. In the Scratch Master Mix, only one of the two positive samples amplified, but none of the negative samples amplify, potentially pointing to betaine as an aid in reducing false positives. Also, time to amplification was improved. However, the addition of betaine had no beneficial effect in the commercial Master Mix. Fur further research should include investigating the effects of betaine in the Scratch Master Mix. Next, I found that the 95 degrees Celsius denaturation step did not aid in sensitivity or time to amplification. I did note, however, that Watts et al. conducted the step on a fluorescence assay using a Cyto82 stain while we used a calorimetric assay. Um, a lot of these results have continued to reinforce the idea that calorimetric assays and fluorescence assays are different and that they likely need different conditions to work appropriately. Finally, the crowning achievement, the scratch calorimetric master mix. Uh, or both of them, actually. The importance of the Scratch Master Mix is, is their accessibility. Not only can they be made up cheaply, but in the case of the calorimetric Master Mix, they can be deployed in the field. As you can see, the Scratch Fluorescent Master Mix is significantly cheaper, $2 versus 70 cents, while the calorimetric Master Mix is slightly cheaper. Also, given their consistency, you are likely going to have to conduct this reaction multiple times, so even small changes in their cost is important. I encourage for future research in the, into the development of the calorimetric master mix especially, as the continued development and improvement of the sensitivity and expediency of the calorimetric assay will be invaluable in unsanitary, poverty-stricken regions given its low cost and ease of use. So uh, yeah, first of all, huge thanks to my mentor, Ms. Laurel Gillette. She was invaluable from literature researches to making up the assays at Madigan while I was back here at Bellarmine. Uh, I could not have done this without her expertise, and I'm so grateful for the hours of hard work. Uh, thank you to Mr. Grote for guiding me along this journey and helping me access all of these resources and information, and also for being the best van driver I've ever met. So, uh, Thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Nielsen for taking us to Hawaii and helping us along the way. Uh, thank you to my parents for their love and support, and thank you to the MC class of 2022. I love you guys, and you guys took some great photos. So. And in the famous words of David S. Pumpkins, any questions? Oh, okay. So um, the question was, how do my um, how do my results compare to the uh, simple like uh, a lateral flow assay? So from what I've read, a lateral flow assay is closer to a pregnancy test. When the fluid rolls across the um, strip, you can uh, detect whether it's, um, it'll like show up like a pregnancy test, two lines positive, one line negative. Um, for that one, that one is closer to the calorimetric assay, actually. It's more binary. Um, it, it would be, again, more helpful in the field like the calorimetric assay, but the fluorescence assay is much more helpful in that you can actually quantify the data. Um, you can see how much amplification there is. Yeah. Any other questions?
Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Mina Nair and I did research on the acute toxicity of N13-dimethylbutyl and phenyl phenylene diamine quinone, otherwise known as 6-PPD quinone to aquatic invertebrates. So a few years ago, there was a study in West Seattle that found that 86% of the adult females of coho salmon died before spawning. That high rate of mortality, along with observations in other streams, led to the recognition that something was wrong with the water. Through research and studies, it was identified that storm water runoff, more specifically at tire leachate, was the cause for the mass mortality. According to the United States Tire Manufacturers Association, 3.1 billion tires are made worldwide annually. And each tire has an average tread depth of eight to nine millimeters, which brings the possibility and result of many tire particles on roads. This residue can find its way to bodies of water through rainfall and other environmental conditions. Each tire is made with a chemical called 6-PPD. 6-PPD is added to tires, rubbers, compounds in order to extend its life, and it's added as a powder and the molecules over time come to the tire surface since they're insoluble. It acts as an antioxidant to react with the ground level ozone before the ozone can damage the rubber of the tire and become 6-PPD quinone. So from this picture, you can see the 6-PPD, um, O3 stands for ozone, and this is it oxidizing to become the 6-PPD quinone. So then it has the ability to dissolve in water, so 6-PPD quinone can move from the tire to water bodies. A few past studies indicate that 6-PPD quinone seems to be the major causative agent for the toxicity of urban runoff. According to Tian's study in 2020, 6-PPD quinone is a toxic chemical causing acute mortality due to tire particle leachate in coho salmon. But in 2021, Hiki tests the aquatic toxi toxicity of 6-PPD quinone with standardized acute toxicity tests to freshwater fish and crusta crustacean species, and they tested four species and found that 6-PPD quinone did not exhibit acute lethal toxicity, even at maximum water solubility. However, there is conflicting information with these two studies, so my goal with this research is to solidify the gap while improving the methods, which I will go into later in my presentation. Additionally, Hiki's study only tests quinone to 100 milligrams per liter, and since this research is so new, the water solubility of 6-PPD quinone is still being discovered. But new research in the past month in labs are finding that the... Um, water solubility is higher than 500 milligrams per liter. This chemical can be seen affecting many freshwater creatures throughout the world. However, the Pacific Northwest has seen the most disastrous effects due to the depleting rates of coho salmon. So due to the customary use of 6-PPD, I tested to find the toxicity of tire wear particle leachate, also known as TWPL, with acute toxicity tests using two daphnid species. Daf, um, Serodaphnodubia and Scleroberis sc mucronate, also known as wild type. So you can see them in the pictures here and how they look like under a microscope. These two species were chosen due to their similarities to the function of coho salmon and their use in environmental toxicology research. Additionally, the wild type is only found in the Pacific Northwest, so they're used to simulate the Pacific Northwest waters, where they're most commonly found. In my research, I conducted initial experimental trials to assess the impacts of the tire wear particle leachate and the 6-PPD quinone on species of aquatic invertebrates. So my independent variable are the concentrations, and my dependent variable is the daphnid mortality. 
And the reason that I use Daphnia and not just testing the coho salmon itself is because, first of all, the Daphnids are much easier to test than coho salmon. They're a very common species, so there's no fear of extinction compared to the coho salmon. They're easy to do research on for toxicology and helping bigger picture studies. And they're on the bottom of the food chain and an important source of food for fish and other aquatic organisms. So these are the four EPA standards that I used in my research. There are a couple modifications that I made to one of them, which I will go into soon. So first, before doing the actual research itself, I had to um, grow the Daphnids myself with, along with my mentor. So this is called husbandry of Daphnids. So for the wild type, um, we collected those near a stream um, near WSU. And for the dubia, we got them shipped, the, shipped in. And I transferred these to, a clean, to clean culture vessels with reverse osmosis water because they're very sensitive to the water that they're in. After this, and all the neonates of daphnids were shipped, um, and we removed the first set of neonates after they reproduced um, because we could not use those in their research because they were stressed from the travel. And then after this, we checked on the daphnids every day and replaced the water and fed them three times a week. And we checked on the cultures daily, removed any deceased daphnids, and after the first few weeks, we started checking for neonates when we replaced the water and fed them. Then we started to create broods, where we remove all the neonates and move them into a separate container until they're ready to reproduce in a few weeks. This helped us create a stable colony for our research. And as I said, the first brood was discarded as they were the babies of the adults that were traveling and could be under stress. So for my methods, so for the tire leach itself, we used Dr. Jen McIntyre's model of using nine unique tires, which is two new tires and seven used tires, and we just used previously reported methods on making the tire leachate. And then um, for the modified EPA standard, so the things that we did the same were isolating the less than 24-hour-old neonates for the procedure, so we didn't use any adults in the testing. Um, and then I had a control and then five concentrations. So we determined the concentrations by concentrations used in past studies as well as a system developed in WSU designed for choosing concentrations. So we wanted a magnitude of five and four steps, so then we got a factor of 1.495. Um, and then, so we had a control and five concentrations, so the color of the, the color of the numbers corresponds to the bottles and then these beakers. So five was our highest concentration, and then 3.34, 2.24, 1.50, and then our lowest concentration was one, and then we had just normal reverse osmosis water. Um, and then I used four cups for each concentration and tested two species, and that's um, five concentrations and one control, so we used 48 cups in total. Um, and then the modification that we made to this EPA standard is feeding um, the Daphnis 0.2 milliliters of food right before we put them in the incubator. And this is because past studies have shown that neonates often have unacceptably low survival in control water if not fed during the 48 hours. So then after this, at the 24 and 48 hour marks, I counted how many died in each concentration. For counting the deceased, I swirled the solution and scanned for live active neonates. And for those harder to find, I used a dissection microscope at three times to ensure for a reliable count. At the lowest magnification, the entire beaker will not show to be visible, so that's why we had to use three times. And then I labeled the neonates as dead when they appeared with a flare carapace and the dark eye spot was still visible as the daphnids do shed, so I had to stick by these to, in order to call them dead. Now for the actual data. So I have four graphs, two for each species, one at the 24 hour mark and one at the 48 hour mark. So the um, X axis are the concentrations and the Y axis are th is the mortality rate. So this is called a dose response graph and dose response data is um, typically graphed with a dose or dose function on the X axis and then the measured response um, or effect on the Y axis. So um, the one line on the y-axis right here 
Um, that would be 100% mortality, and all, all of the 10 neonates in the beaker died. And these are also average data um, of the dubia at 24 hours. So we can see that the controls did um, significantly well. Um, maybe there were a couple of them that died, but nothing that was too concerning, making the data unusable. But we can see that m most of the beakers are almost completely dead and um, close to dying. And then at the 48 hours mark, we can see that all of them have died, but the control, the control is still doing pretty well and is at the 90% um, at the 90% survival, so the data is usable. And this is something that we were not expecting to see um, from the data. We are expecting to see um, at the lower concentrations for lower mortality and at the higher concentrations, higher mortality. And then for the wild type, um, this is more of the data that we were expecting to see. So at the lower concentrations, you can see that there is lower mortality, and at the higher concentrations, um, there's almost complete mortality. And for the wild type, all of them survived. There was no mortality at the 24-hour mark. Um, and then the data just kept um, moving as expected. Um, there was nothing that we weren't expecting with this. Um, there was a little bit of mortality with the controls, but nothing too concerning. And the highest, um, the highest concentration had the highest mortality, which is what we were expecting. So we also did an early quinone trial, so which is shown by this graph, um, and the x and y axis are the same. Um, and because there was absolutely no mortality with either of the species, um, I just combined the graphs together. So the early quinone trials we did did not exhibit any mortality, and the controls had full survival, but none of the trials killed the Daphnids. However, the exposure to the tire wear particle leachate caused high mortality. The dubia showed complete mortality in every concentration, while the micronated or the wild type showed upwards mortality. Both species responded heavily to the leachate, so when comparing the quinone, quinone data with the leachate data, it's clear that another chemical or mix of chemicals are affecting the species. This data helps solidify the gap between the differing species, and Tian and Hiki had conflicting information about the toxicity of 6-PPD quinone, but this research signifies more studies need to be done on the entire leachate, rather than just focusing on the 6-PPD quinone. So my research aligns with Hiki's study as we both signif um, signify that quinone is not the toxic chemical in the leachate to aquatic invertebrates. Um, and this is significant, this is very like new research and the data that we found um, will highly alter the path of the f of future research on quinone and on the leachate. So some limitations that we had so the cultures were not doing well um, when we started thinking about this research. So we had to completely restart the Daphnid cultures. And since this took so long and some of the species were unstable, we could not properly use them for the research. For example, we started with growing the Daphnia magna species, um, but the reverse osmosis water that we used accidentally got spoiled and the Daphnids got completely wiped out. So um, we grew them to uh, big enough to use them for the research, but this unfortunately took out and wiped out the entire stock, so we had to restart. So the process of getting the dubia and wild type to a stable place took almost half a year in order to actually use them for the research. And then to improve the leachate research in the future, there should be a solution renewal at the 24 hours mark. Past research signifies that the quinone degrading it quit, uh, degrades 15% every hour. And to accurately simulate stormwater runoff pulsing, there should be a renewal. We were supposed to do a solution renewal at 24 hours. However, we got the dilutions wrong for the um, tire leachate. So we decided not to continue with it to alter our data. However, I do believe this will get a little more accurate results, but will still follow the same trend line that I got. And then for future research, so 6-PPD might be toxic, but just not in a 48-hour time span since uh, we did acute toxicity tests. So I am continuing my research at WSU with the chronic toxicity tests. 
So chronic toxicity tests are 28-day toxicity tests that now need to be conducted on multiple species of daphnids. This will give a comprehensive look at the chemical to see if it alters reproduction rates, eating habits, or causes mass mortality in a larger time span. This will better um, understand the uh, acute mortality data, as well as gives us more information about how 6-PPD quinone functions. And then, since this research shows that there are other chemicals in the leachate causing mortality, there needs to be studies about the leachate as a whole and specifically testing the other chemicals in it rather than only focusing on the 6-PPD quinone. Since there was one study that signified that quinone, like early on, that quinone was the chemical causing the um, toxicity, um, they haven't looked at other parts of the leachate since they were so focused on the quinone. Um, and then I just want to say thank you to Dr. Drysnack and the WSU Puyallup Research Extension Center for um, taking me under their wing and teaching me what a research project is in its full span and for giving me the opportunity to work with them for the next year until I go to college um, for the uh, chronic toxic, uh, toxicity tests. And then I'd like to say thank you to Mr. DeGroat for um, always being supportive and um, whether it was the research paper or actually um, finding me this connection, you've been um, utmost supportive. And then to my mom and dad for all the love and support and all the late nights at the lab through this research. And then Mr. and Mrs. Nielsen for a fantastic Hawaii trip and then the class of 2022 for a fantastic Port Townsend and Hawaii trip. And then these are my um, citations. And then are there any questions? Yeah, so we determined the concentration just based on um, what other research signified as well as um, the quinone concentration in the leachate. So there were, it was 1,300 micrograms of, uh, of the quinone. So we wanted a high quinone concentration as well as um, the concentrations were also signified by the software that WSU has for their toxicology research, um, and they determine concentrations that way. So we picked, a, uh, we picked a certain magnitude and then the steps we wanted, and then it gave us those numbers. Yes. Yeah, so the, while, oh, yeah. Um, so the question was, what do you think um, determined the, like, the different death rates between the two species, um, the dubia and the wild type? So actually, before we started this research, um, we thought the, the wild type would have a higher mortality rate throughout the concentrations because it's a more sensitive species. Um, but it also has never been used in toxicology research, so it was very new to us. Um, but it was actually the opposite, with the dubia being completely, um, completely prone to dying compared to the wild type. So we're actually not sure why the difference is, um, but it could be just because there's something else in the leachate that is more that makes the dubia more sensitive to that compared to the wild type. So it could, it's probably something um, not related to quinone at all, but something that's in that solution. Thank you. We're uh, a little bit more than halfway through. This is maybe a good time just to kind of take a couple minute uh, stretch break. And then uh, Joey Vaughn's going to be our next. So, Joey, take your time. Joey, you can even lead us in calisthenics if you like. Get us warmed up for your baseball presentation.
as well as on base percentage. Uh, in 2019, another study was done by Pullman Holzer in which, once again, these same statistics, strikeouts, walk rate, and stolen base rate, all were found to have similar correlation. And then once again, Anderson conducted a similar study finding almost identical results, although on base percentage was lower, but still had a high correlation between levels. So why does finding how minor leaguers do and seeing how they'll do in the majors, why does it matter? And the reason is because of a lack of efficiency. From 1981 to 2010, only 17.6% of players ever drafted were on a major league roster. And this means they were just on the roster for any point in time. So they could have played one game or not even made an appearance. And so this is an awfully low success rate and teams need to find other way to get talent. If teams can discover players before they reach the majors, not only will they acquire this talent cheaper from a monetary perspective, but also in terms of assets given up, such as talented prospects or proven major league players. Moreover, it's easier to make a bigger impact on franchises with recent stars such as Fernando Tatis Jr. and MLB All-Star and past Cy Young Award winner Jake Arrieta helping change the trajectory of their franchise after being acquired is unproven big leaguers. And so really with this scouting, there needs to be a way to take what scouts see and make this quantifiable and objective. Because as humans, we all have an inherent bias. Whether it's evaluating players based on the raw pot power potential they see, or if it's a pitcher, if they can throw really hard, instead of objectively looking at how these individual talents fit into the overall body of a player. And so with statistics, this subjectivity can be removed and for my specific study, we looked at the upper minor league levels, specifically the AA and AAA levels in relation to the majors. As one, these levels have standardized number of teams throughout levels. And additionally, because this kind of weeds out the lower talent, as players in the AA and AAA levels are more likely to make it to the majors than those in the lower A levels. So the overall purpose of my study was to find statistical trends, specifically seeing which stats from the minors to the majors had the highest rate of correlation. So for instance, if a player has a high strikeout rate in double A, will he have a high strikeout rate in the majors? As well as predict or successfully predict and forecast future results of overall major league performance in terms of offense. For this, on base plus slugging was used as it's considered one of the most comprehensive old school baseball statistics. Though there are newer stats that may do this job better, I'll mention in the limitations later why these were not accessible. So my hypothesis was that strikeout and walk rate will be the most consistent statistics throughout the various levels, while home run rate will be the biggest factor in determining on-base plus slugging, OPS, one of the most comprehensive traditional baseball statistics for offensive performance. So in terms of my methods and procedures, I originally used a baseball savant custom leaderboard as you were able to easily manipulate data and filter players based on number of at-bats as well as uh, many other qualifications. So I filtered players by at-bats from the years of 2015 through 2020 with players needing at least 580 at-bats in a given season in the major leagues to be qualified. From there I used MLB.com, MILB.com which is the minor league website as well as baseball reference to collect data on these various players. Overall Data was collected from three levels, the AA level, the AAA level, and the major league level, with 35 variables or pieces of data collected for each player. Overall, there were 104 players in the minor, or in AA, 94 players in AAA, and 109 players in the majors. This difference is due to the fact that at the minor league levels, a player must have played at least 10 games at that level to help fi filter out players who may have just returned to those levels for rehab assignments after already making it to the majors. For data analysis, I had to uh, learn the coding language R on RStudio Cloud. And from there, I used the coding language to help develop different models and graphs to help analyze the data. OK, so now the results in discussion. Really quickly to just explain this before we get started. The green represents statistics that showed the highest level of correlation in their given pod, while red represents statistics that had the lowest correlation. Moreover, all the statistics on the left side or the, of a column represent the actual figures, 
while the right represent the mean of those figures in relation to the mean of the majors. So as you can see, because of this, all the major leagues will have uh, one is their mean value compared to the big leagues as you're comparing it to itself. And so really this data showed a few interesting results. For one, my hypothesis was somewhat proven correctly. As I mentioned earlier, I assumed strikeout rate would have a high rate of correlation, which it did, though other things such as fielding percentage, slugging percentage, and total bases per at bat also had a high correlation. However, some of my hypothesis was proven incorrect, such as walk rate, which I assumed would have a high correlation. It actually turned out to have one of the lowest correlations, which is due to the fact that as you go up in levels from AA to AAA to the majors, pitchers tend to be more accurate throwing less balls and therefore yielding fewer walks. Additionally, as I mentioned earlier, some interesting trends. Fielding percentage stays the same throughout, as do stolen bases. And these make sense as a player tends to stay at his relative capabilities when fielding. Although he can improve slightly or decline, it tends to remain either a strength or weakness of that player. The same can be said of speed. And then just some overall conclusions from this data. Double uh, A tended to be more similar compared to the majors, which helps explain the recent phenomenon of many teams sending their top prospects to the double A level instead of to the triple A level before making it to the majors. So as you can see, in most of these categories, the average for the AA was closer to that of MLB compared to the AAA level. And this also leads to one of my final conclusions that AAA was very offensive heavy. And this is for multiple reasons. Um, one, the baseball used in AAA helps favor offense. I'll mention this more later in terms of seam height. Moreover, many AAA stadiums are located in the southwest part of the United States, places like Albuquerque and Reno or in places of high elevation such as Colorado. This leads to high offensive numbers as the ball is able to travel further in these locations. And finally from this data, MLB is really seen as an all or nothing type of league. What I mean by this is strikeout rate was the highest in Major League Baseball, while home run rate was also fairly high. And this is due to the fact that at the major league level, there are elite pitchers throwing harder, mostly in the upper 90s compared to these other levels. And so teams and players have really just taken the strategy that it's almost impossible to get two or three hits in a given inning to score runs, whereas home runs are guaranteed runs, therefore putting more of an emphasis on home runs overall. Next, for the second half of my study, more just looking at the how to predict the overall success through on base plus slugging. So in all these graphs you'll see shortly, this y-axis stays the same with on base plus slugging. It's pretty simple as it sounds, the on-base percentage plus the slugging percentage. However, in this case, we are looking at the RBI rate times the home run rate. And so out of all the different combinations of variables studied, this had the strongest positive correlation, meaning that is one variable, in this case, RBI rate times home run rate increased, on-base percentage plus slugging increased. And so as you can see here, all three of the lines follow a similar pattern. And this was expected, as mentioned in my hypothesis, due to the fact that home runs play a big role both in slugging as well as on base percentage. Because in terms of slugging, you're getting four points for it as you are recording four bases and you're reaching base, so that's going to affect on base percentage as well. And this was interesting as run producing stats, those that tend to measure how many runs you're going to score in a game, tended to have a high positive correlation overall to on base plus slugging. Next is the same on base plus slugging, but in comparison to strikeout to walk ratio. And right here, out of all the combination of statistics studied, this had the strongest negative correlation. So as strikeout per walk rate goes up, on base plus slugging percentage goes down. And although this was expected, not to this extent, as it was still thought that players who strike out more are going to have a higher on base plus slugging, as they also tend to hit more home runs. And this is especially noteworthy in an era of increased strikeouts, showing that this risk reward may not always be worthwhile. And finally, one statistic that showed no correlation was the stolen base rate to on base plus slugging. And this is very interesting because, as mentioned in one of my previous slides, stolen base rate tended to be similar throughout levels, meaning that if a player had a high stolen base rate at the double A AA or triple A level, he was likely to steal many bases in the majors obviously due to the fact that speed is one of those 
more given talents rather than something you work on over time. However, this has shown that it doesn't tend to impact overall offense as seen by the lack of correlation here in this graph. So some limitations in the study. Um, for one, it was an observational study. So you can't account for all these confounding variables. For one, obviously, you have the human element involved. No model can perfectly simulate all human activity, though with large sample sizes, you're able to mitigate this. Additionally, as baseball is a team sport, many st statistics are team dependent. For example, if a hitter is playing against a better fielding team, it may be harder to record a hit than if he's playing against a worse fielding team, though overall, these statistics should even out over, once again, a large sample size. Another limitation or discrepancy was differences in baseballs, as I mentioned earlier. Up until recently, the minor leagues had used a different baseball compared to the majors. As you can see, the seam height, minor leagues tended to feature higher seams, and this is due to the fact that with the higher seam rate or seam height, there is a higher drag rate leading to more movement measured in RPMs. So basically at the minor league levels to help simulate, simulate major league pitching, pitchers were given access to these higher seam balls, allowing for more movement, and also the ball would travel further, leading to those high offensive numbers, as I pointed out earlier, especially at the AAA level. Additionally, there are no standardized dimensions in baseball. Although the infield has standardized dimensions, outfields range in size, creating smaller and larger parks. So it may be easier to hit a home run in a place like Coors Field in Colorado versus out in the right by the Bay of San Francisco at AT&T Park. And that kind of brings us to our last limitation. As I mentioned earlier, there are new statistics such as war, weighted runs created plus, which is one of the most comprehensive statistics used to measure the overall output of a player, as well as other things such as OPS plus. However, these statistics are not available to the public at the minor league level, making this study impossible to do with those resources. And with this, there are also many areas of future research. As mentioned, the, the new StatCast and Sabermetric revolution, pretty soon there will be access to these newer statistics. Just really quickly, I mentioned earlier things like OPS plus. Those pluses at the end of those statistics indicate park factor. And basically what this does is it helps mitigate the effects, as mentioned earlier, between the different sizes in ballparks, where a hitter that's playing in a more pitcher-friendly ballpark will be given more credit for doing well there while playing in a hitter-friendly ballpark will be given less credit. And so, once again, these newer statistics are gonna help mitigate those confounding variables. Additionally, instead of looking at this from the minor league level, you could look at it from the perspective of many foreign leagues to the big leagues, whether it's the KBO in Korea, the NPB in Japan, the Mexican League, or many other leagues, as well as many high-level college programs such as Vanderbilt and Mississippi State. Also, you could look at the impact of reorganization as I mentioned earlier, prior to the 2020 season, MLB did not have standardization in terms of the number of single A affiliates a given major league team could have. And so some teams would have more players and other players would have to go through more levels to get to the big leagues. And so that'd be something to just look at the reorganization and standardization of this process. And finally, the same process could be applied on the other side of the ball, looking at pitchers instead of hitters. In terms of thank yous, I'd like to thank my mentor, Mr. Skyler Shibaima, the Seattle Mariners Director of Data Strategy, who was really helpful in me formulating this project as well as helping with any coding problems I may encounter. My family for always being supportive during this process. Mr. DeGroote for helping keep me on track and helping me organize my paper. Mr. and Mrs. Nielsen for being great chaperones on the Hawaii trip. The whole Marine Chem class of 2022 for always being supportive during the process. Professor Scott Nessler and Seth Berry of the University of Notre Dame for helping me originally learn R and dive deeper into that. And finally, former Mariners third baseman Kyle Seeger for sitting down with me and helping me formulate this project. Here are my references and any questions. Okay, so the question was, how did I develop an interest in this? 
And then do I see this process being used in similar or in baseball in the future? So I've just always really had a passion for baseball. And I think uh, over the summer a few years ago, I did a Notre Dame summer program using R and looking at sports analytics. And so then I just wanted to expand that to baseball. And then in terms of this process being used in the future, um, it definitely will be, at least in terms of R. R, you may not have heard of it in terms of the coding language. However, it is used in over 90% of the sports world. And so it's the primary coding language for R and something that's definitely used by both uh, outside franchises like ESPN as well as teams like the Seattle Mariners. Yes. Well, okay, the question was who is the best baseball player of all time? And I think this depends, although uh, one of the most comprehensive stats, as I mentioned, war currently gives the edge to Barry Bonds, although there are since he took steroids, this is inconclusive. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, so the question was, I was more looking at this from like a club and evaluating players. Can this be used to help players evaluate themselves? And I think, um, yes, you could obviously use these in terms of marketing, like if you're trying to negotiate a contract. For instance, if a player hasn't yet made it to the majors through things like arbitration or whatever, but yet could still get a raise, they could say, hey, if I have a low strikeout right now, I project well to the majors, and then they could use that to help market themselves in the future. Um, the question was, which is more impactful now, managers or statisticians? And it's actually something where, although managers still are technically in charge, the role of stats has played more and more of a role, as most prominently seen in the 2020 World Series when the Tampa Bay Rays lifted pitcher Blake Snell. And this was mostly due to statistical analysis rather than actual gameplay. Double tap what? Wait, wait. <laughs> How do I get my speaker notes? Oh, show up? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Rachel Daniel and I'm investigating the correlations between endometriosis and the bacteria found in peritoneal fluid. This summer, I worked at Madigan Army Medical Center and I was super fortunate to be exposed to a research environment. A big question we would ask ourselves before we would start a research brainstorming session or just simply an experiment was how will our, res how will our research benefit others? And especially since Madigan is an Army Institute, we specifically wanted to see how we can help people in the military. So we came across the issue of endometriosis. Now, in a female healthy reproductive organ, there are tissues that specifically reside in the uterus. But there are times when these tissues start moving out into different areas, like the intestines, the pelvic cavity, and the fallopian tubes. Now this is extremely painful, and when these tissues start moving out, this is caused by a disorder called endometriosis. Endometriosis plagues women daily and can even prevent women from going to work. 
This can lead to some scarring and um, superficial implants, and sometimes even cysts called endometriomas will form. It affects women of all ages, especially those in their 30s and 40s, and um, it can be extremely problematic as it creates swelling of internal tissues and uh, prevents the egg from being fertilized, which then prevents um, pregnancies. So you can see here, here's the healthy side of a female reproductive organ, and this is the side affected by endometriosis. And you can see that there's like these little red cysts um, scattered throughout that's not seen here. Those are the endometriomas. And they're even found in the ovaries, which prevents the egg from being fertilized, which then prevents pregnancy. So obviously, this is a very problematic issue. So our project was inspired by a recently published article by Chen and his associates in a research magazine called Nature Communications. This article goes on to describe endometriosis and how they found a great degree of bacteria in the peritoneum and as a result of women actually having endometriosis. So now the peritoneum is simply just the tissues that line across the um, stomach region and it's considered one of the most sterile parts of the body. So Chen believed in this theory called retrograde menstruation, which is where the bacteria found in the uterus moves upwards. And as a result, he believed that it would infect the peritoneum and introduce bacteria there. And it was really interesting because the peritoneum is considered one of the most sterile parts of the body. So there being bacteria there is um, you know, a conflict of interest. So this diagram here is actually from Chen's paper. And you can see these are the different types of bacteria found in each region of the female reproductive organ. And as you move upwards, there's um, slowly more and more diversity seen in the species of bacteria found. So this supports this finding in that um, as you move upwards, there's more and more bacteria. So after studying this paper closely, Madigan Army and Medical Center and I wondered if his samples were contaminated in some way. So we decided to replicate his experiment. However, we made a few minor changes before we moved forward. The first change we made was that we would obtain our samples in a way that would not contaminate our samples um, like Chen might have done. So Chen uh, obtained his samples by inserting a tube through the esophagus, which actually um, collected his samples from there. For us, we were able to ask our doctors um, to ask their patients if they'd be willing to donate their peritoneal fluid when they were already open during surgery. And those who consented, we were able to receive their samples and be able to do testing on them. So we also altered the samples from whom we collected our um, fluids. We used a more diverse population of a wide range of ages, differing BMIs, and varying diets. The overall purpose was just simply to assess the concentration of bacterial DNA in the sample, as well as its purity. So our hypothesis was similar to Chen's. If a woman has endometriosis, then there will be simply more bacteria found in the peritoneal fluid. This basically means that we were testing women who had the disorder and to see if there would be a significant concentration of bacteria found there. So we had two groups in our experiment, a control group of fluid samples from women without endometriosis, and an experimental group of peritoneal fluid samples from women with endometriosis. So the first step was to extract the DNA found in each sample with a Zymobiomics DNA microprep kit, the same one that Chen used in his own paper. And from there, we would calculate the bacterial um, DNA in each tube to see if there was actually a presence of bacteria found. Now, for all of our samples, we, we wanted a pellet, which is a bunch of cells clumped together at the bottom of our um, tubes, so we would be able to extract the DNA from there. But to produce a pellet, we would centrifuge in between testings, and that way the samples were able to be shaken. Um, so if there is a significant concentration of bacteria found, we would move on to qPCR. So qPCR would allow the DNA to be amplified and provide us a more accurate reading of the concentration. And um, to dive, deep, dive in deeper, we would move on to 16S rRNA sequencing, which would sort of um, identify the different types of bacterial species found in our samples. And lastly, we would culture the bacteria in the peritoneal fluid samples to provide a comparison between the bacteria that we actually did find. So there were nine samples from women without endometriosis. And then there were seven from women in the half stage of endometriosis, nine from the three-fourth stage of endometriosis, two from the, our positive control of pseudomonas, and one from our negative control. 
So the mean concentrations in nanograms per microliters are listed in this table, and um, we can definitely see that our positive control had the highest mean concentration, and our um, lowest was our half stage of endometriosis. But something really significant to note is that the mean concentration was higher from samples without endometriosis in comparison to those um, with the samples from women who actually did have endometriosis. So the data from the previous table is now um, just noted on this graph. And so the N represents the sample size. And you can see here that our positive control of pseudomonas is way more significant than um, our like, samples from women without endometriosis and from women with endometriosis. So regardless, you can see here that all of our samples really had low concentrations of DNA. So really, we discovered that the concentrations of DNA were negligible and nowhere near our positive control. So if the concentrations were significant, it should look like our positive control here. So using the nanodrop spectrophotometer, we would uh, measure the purity of DNA as well as its con concentration. And this is basically the machine here. We would be able to drop a sample in here and it would like use um, like the absorbance of light and we would be able to see the results here. So now in this graph, we were basically assessing the contamination and of our concentration. And so the dotted line here shows the purity level of um, our DNA samples. So if, it, if the samples were pure, then it should reach a A260 by 280 ratio of two. And this ratio is just simply like the ratio of different absorbance of light for DNA. So you can see here that a lot of our samples exceeded this line. So we want the samples to be closer to this line. And I, you can guess that like these samples were super contaminated, like look at like three-fourths endometriosis. But the only reason for this is because our samples were, had such low concentrations that the purity was not being able to be measured accurately and was actually skewed as a result. So this wasn't really an accurate um, portrayal of the purity in our samples. So a type of bacteria that we were especially interested to find was Pseudomonas, as Chen found a great concentration of it in his own findings. And we wanted to see if our research would match up with the bacteria he also found. So we cultured on tri um, triptic soy agar plates with 5% sheep blood with peritoneal fluid samples as our negative control and culture pseudomonas as our um, positive control. Now, um, we incubated the cultures overnight over a 24-hour period at a 37 degrees Celsius. And if the two cultures were to look the same, then we would know that there was pseudomonas in our peritoneal fluid samples. Now, this is not the case. You can clearly see here that there's more of an evident presence of pseudomonas on our positive control, and there's like next to nothing seen here. So clearly, pseudomonas is not found in our peritoneal fluid samples. So our findings have led to the conclusion that the peritoneal fluid microbiome is negligible if present at all. This contrasts with the findings of Chen, who reported high DNA concentrations following extraction of around 300 to 400 nanograms per microliter and micro microbial profiles that um, were predictive of disease status and um, with or without endometriosis. This has led us to question whether the methods used by Chen led to contamination of a sample and um, maybe due to him using samples um, that were like pulled along the reproductive tract. So due to consistent low bacterial findings in our experimental group that were also confirmed after our qPCR, um, we did not find enough evidence of a heavy bacterial presence in the peritoneum, which is why we did not move forward into sequencing as we had a low concentration in itself. Um, so before I mentioned that we used the Zymobiomics DNA MicroPrep kit to extract DNA, we also used two other kits to ensure that our kit itself wasn't contaminated. So in using multiple kits, we were able to get a more accurate reading, and in all, we found that we got low concentrations from all of our DNA samples. So the results of our experiment did not support our hypothesis or Chen's hypothesis. So we originally thought we would have more bacteria, but um, this is not so. And we discovered that bacterial concentrations are actually comparable between women with and without endometriosis, 
and this is seen with our control and experimental group sharing similar results. And this supports past findings that the peritoneum remains sterile and test Chen's findings as we replicated his ex same experiment and gained different results. Future results can be, future research can be done to study um, um, by studying like bacterial concentrations in different parts of the body. And so you can study like the intestines and see what happens if a woman does have endometriosis or if a woman doesn't have endometriosis. And endometriosis itself is such, such an underrated issue within our community and it honestly needs to be addressed um, as there's so many unknowns surrounding this mysterious condition and we should strive to uncover its mysteries and help women in the workforce. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Zachary Colburn and Ms. Laurel Gillette, Captain Reynolds, Dr. Robert Burney, and Aaron Bardwell from Madigan Army Medical Center. Um, I just want to thank you guys for letting me come out to the lab, and it was a lot of fun, and thanks for answering all of my questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Dick Grode, for supporting us for the past four years and helping me with my um, research. And thank you, Ms. Etter, for also helping me um, understand all the research papers. And shout out to the Marine Chem class of 2022. It's been a lot of fun. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, yes. Um, can you repeat your question? Yes, yeah, so the question was would, um, um, basically yes, it would remain the same because the correlations will remain the same because we use several aliquots from the same like samples. So we were able to do like DNA extraction maybe more than 100 times and we still found the same correlation. So I would agree that like the correlation remains the same if we did increase the sample size. Um, Jalen? Okay, so the positive control is just us um, culturing the bacteria on there. So there has to be bacteria on there. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Mina. Mhm. Mm so we wanted to help women in the military, especially because. The military is so demanding on the body, and women in the workforce, especially in the military, face this issue. So we need to support the people who are serving our like nation. And endometriosis is really common among like women in the military. So that's also something that future Marine Chem kids can also study if they want to. But yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Aiden. pretty common. I don't know the exact statistic, but it's pretty common. Thank you. I'm Saul Condos Cohen. And I'm Ekaterina Condos Cohen. And our project is determining the efficiency of water filtration at Snake Lake Nature Preserve using mass spectrophotometry. As advancements in technology allow for synthetic materials and chemicals to revolutionize our society, 
The consequences stemming from the use of these artificial substances have become increasingly controversial. Substances such as pesticides and fungicides are known to pose a threat to fish health and endanger vulnerable life stages of certain species. Virtually no body of water on Earth is without traces of human activity. Endocrine disruptors such as estrogen and opioids are known to be carried in runoff into lakes and streams during periods of heavy rainfall. These chemicals pose a serious threat to the lives of many aquatic organisms, and detection of these chemicals is important to keep our local aquatic ecosystem clean and safe for wildlife. A predominant source of toxic chemicals in the ocean is urban runoff. Tacoma is made up of nine sub-watersheds, as shown in the image above. In each of these sub-watersheds, runoff accumulates in ponds and lakes or is directed into the Puget Sound, where harmful substances can be more widely circulated. Sneak Lake is located in the Flett Creek watershed, which is highlighted in pink above. So, how do we know when harmful substances are present in our local bodies of water? Well, testing water for individual man-made chemicals would be impractical and hard to accomplish. Since testing is a lengthy process, and it's hard to determine exactly which chemicals are in any body of water. So, how can we test for harmful substances in general? To detect harmful chemicals in water, certain indicators are often used to determine their presence. Indicators are chemicals themselves, and they travel into bodies of water through runoff at the same rate as the dangerous chemicals that we're looking for which enables researchers like us to determine the presence of more concerning substances. Not just any substance can be used. As we'll explain in our methods, we can only use substances that we have in the pure form um, in the lab, and these pure substances are hard to get a hold of. For our purposes, we had to choose a substance that was predominantly used by humans. We decided to go with the most commonly used psycho psychoactive substance in the world, a substance used almost exclusively by humans. and that is caffeine. As a molecule that doesn't easily degrade, caffeine is a perfect indicator of other, more dangerous pollutants, especially due to its abundant usage in our society. 85% of the US population consumes at least one caffeinated beverage per day. Caffeine is a molecule found in nature, but it isn't produced anywhere naturally in the Pacific Northwest, meaning that any caffeine we find will be from human activity. When caffeine is introduced to the environment, it doesn't just disappear. Studies report that its half-life is about 10 years, meaning that in any given sample of caffeine, it will take about 10 years for half of the molecules to break down. Caffeine can be found in a lot of things we consume every day. Coffee, chocolate bars, energy drinks, carbonated beverages, and more. Before we began our research, it was important to consider past research regarding the use of caffeine as an indicator. There weren't any studies in our exact testing location to compare our results to, but this literature was still important to consider when we were developing our experimental design. Each of these studies tell us something important about the use of caffeine as an indicator. The findings that concentrations that of caffeine are related to concentrations of fecal coliforms are especially important because fecal coliforms are markers of water contamination in general, and they're bacteria that are found in, uh, found in sewer pipes. Estrogen is also alarming to find in water as it has adverse effects on fish and other wildlife. While much has been studied regarding the presence of harmful substances, especially plastics in our oceans, less has been studied in smaller scale bodies of water. It is important to study small scale urban lakes in particular as they are much closer to human activity. Snake Lake, the chosen location for the study, is a 17-acre urban lake and wetland. 80% of the water in Snake Lake consists of storm water from a large 584-acre urban area in Tacoma. Snake Lake's proximity to urban developments, including a highway overpass above the lake, makes it a good choice for our purposes. At Snake Lake, we chose three data collection sites. One sample was collected near to a pipe at the northern tip of the lake where runoff was known to flow into the lake. Another was collected from underneath a bridge at the center of the lake, and a third sample was collected from a small pond between the pipe and bridge that was removed from both the hiking trail and the other parts of the lake. Water flows into the lake from the northernmost point and moves in a southern direction. So comparing these three sites may show a change in caffeine concentrations due to their respective locations. Make sure to note that the map on our slides has the northern direction pointing down. 
so water will move on our map from bottom up. Although there is a second bridge present at Snake Lake, as seen at the top of our map, no samples were collected at this location, as the lake was dry when we began collecting data and there was no water to sample at that time. Before we collected any water, we tied mason jars with string and rinsed them with tap water. Samples were collected by lowering each jar beneath the surface of the water and retrieving the jars using string, as shown in the pictures above. After collection, jars were kept in an airtight bag in a freezer to avoid any degradation of caffeine. We prepared our samples to be tested in a chemistry lab with Joey and Liz, two chemistry undergraduate students at the University of Puget Sound. First, we measured 60 milliliters of each sample into beakers, 50 micrometers of what we call an internal standard, which is a pure version of caffeine, were added to each sample. The internal standard is important for testing because it is used by the instrument to detect all versions of the caffeine molecule and compare it to the molecules found in the sample. All the samples were transferred to large syringes which were attached to syringe filters as shown in the leftmost image. These filters were used to filter out debris before the sample water reached the HLB cartridges for solid phase extraction. The HLB cartridges without syringes attached are pictured in our second image. In solid phase extraction, sticky beads in the HLB cartridges stick to caffeine molecules in our samples while the liquid of the sample passes through. Because of the chemistry of the HLB cartridges, water does not dislodge molecules from these beads, but methanol does. So we use methanol to use in all of our samples to uh, dilute all of our caffeine and concentrate it into a few milliliters of, caffeine, of methanol. Next, each test tube was placed on a hot plate to evaporate the methanol away, as pictured in our third image. Nitrogen was also blown onto the samples to help evaporate the methanol, and this left only caffeine dried at the bottom of the test tube. Finally, we added one milliliter of a solution consisting, consisting of water and methanol to each test tube. So our 60 milliliters of sample were now concentrated down to just one milliliter for testing. To test our samples, we used a time of flight mass spectrophotometer at the University of Puget Sound to determine caffeine concentrations in each sample. A time of flight mass spectrophotometer is advantageous over similar instruments due to its greater sensitivity and mass accuracy. Our results are summarized here. It should be noted that beginning around our September 20th sample, the data undertook a noticeable ship. And for this reason, our data is split into two graphs. Snake Lake is a seasonal wetland, meaning that it is only full during the fall and winter seasons. At the start of data collection, Snake Lake was not full, so water was not flowing from one sampling location to the next. Between our September 17th and September 20th samples, there was enough precipitation to reestablish water flow across Snake Lake, meaning that water near the pipe sample was now flowing down the lake toward the bridge sample and the pipe sample for the first time. The graph on the left shows the concentration of caffeine in all three samples before the lake was filled. Overwhelmingly, the sampling location with the highest concentration of caffeine was our pipe sample. This isn't surprising because runoff flows into Snake Lake through the pipe at the northern end of the lake. So caffeine collects there first and is unable to move further down the lake. The bridge sample contained very little caffeine in our first six samples, and the log sample contained almost no caffeine at all. An average value for each sample is also shown to the right of the graph to show a general comparison between samples during this time period. The graph on the right shows caffeine concentrations after water flow in the lake was reestablished. Note that the highest concentration value on the left graph is over 150 parts per billion, while the highest value on the right graph is less than 15 parts per billion. Prior to the lake refilling, the average concentration of caffeine at the pipe sample was 99.8, and this average dropped to 8.8 .8 parts per billion when water was flowing in the lake. In contrast, the average caffeine concentration at the bridge sample increased from one part per billion to about 4.5 as caffeine began to travel down the lake. Concentrations at the log sample, which was in a pond separated from the main lake, were close to zero, often being too small to be detected by the instrument. So, is Snake Lake effective at filtering caffeine? Well, our data seems to say that yes, Snake Lake is somewhat effective at filtering caffeine, meaning that it is also somewhat effective at filtering harmful substances. Our results supported our hypothesis that the caffeine concentration in Snake Lake would decrease significantly as caffeine traveled across the lake. 
After the water flow of the lake was restored at the end of September, only 51.7% of the caffeine found at the mouth of the lake was found midway through the lake. Thus, Snake Lake is somewhat effective at filtering harmful substances. Our conclusion is largely based on the graph to the right, which we've redisplayed above. These data points were collected during a period of time when water was flowing from the pipe sample all the way to the bottom of the lake and beyond to the larger Puget Sound area. This period of time is when Snake Lake is supposed to be filtering harmful chemicals. While the data from our other graph seems to make our conclusion obvious, as less than 1% of the caffeine in the pipe sample was found in the other two sampling locations, this is due to a confounding factor, which was the fact that caffeine was accumulating at the mouth of the lake due to the fact that it had nowhere else to go. The large discre discrepancy in values from the pipe sample between our two graphs is also concerning, as it indicates that the majority of the caffeine at the pipe was released into the lake when the lake was refilled, which may have released harmful chemicals into the wetland and beyond as well. Snake Lake is a wetland that feeds a Deflet Creek holding basin, a body of water in Lakewood that drains a Deflet Creek, which connects with Chambers Creek before entering the Puget Sound. Again, the caffeine molecules are not what is concerning about these findings. As an indicator for a variety of harmful substances, the trends observed in caffeine concentrations allow us to conclude that other, more concerning chemicals may be flowing through Snake Lake and directly into Flat Creek. As a local wetland that receives 80% of its water from runoff, focusing on Snake Lake and similar ecosystems for water filtration can enable scientists to curb this environmental issue at the source by catching harmful chemicals before they enter larger bodies of water and reach sea life populations. In regards to future research, we faced multiple limitations that could be beneficial to avoid in future research. Unfortunately, two of our samples were lost during sample processing, and these two samples were collected during the period of time that when water flow was established at Snake Lake. So these samples would have painted a clear statistical picture to help us develop our conclusions. However, our main experimental concern was with our mass spectrophotometer. Over the summer of 2021, the instrument was broken, and we were unable to test our samples. The extreme precision and complexity of the instrument made it difficult to fix, and it ended up being broken until late December. This meant that our samples were in the freezer for over two months before they were tested. Freezing samples is a safe method of preserving caffeine to ensure that no molecules break down. However, it is not ideal, and it would have been preferred to test our samples earlier. There are many possibilities for future research in this field. In the scope of our project, testing Snake Lake's waters across all four seasons or with a higher number of samples would increase would allow us to see how caffeine flows in Snake Lake with more clarity. And there are many other bodies of water in the Tacoma area that could be tested using our methods. There are also many other interesting branches of research to explore. While we chose caffeine for our project, it is also possible to test for the heart medication gabapentin or cotinine, which is a metabolite of nicotine. We'd like to extend a big thank you to Dr. Dan Bergard at the University of Puget Sound for um, really thinking out our project with us and giving us direction for where we wanted to go with it and also for granting us access to the labs at the, uh, the University of Puget Sound and its amazing students. And on that note, Liz Coleman and Joey Moroso, thank you so much for helping us with everything in the lab and really just making the project special. Mr. DeGroat, thank you for always pushing us and making this project the best thing that it could be. Mr. and Mrs. Nielsen, thank you for your endless support and for being the best chaperones on the Hawaii trip we could ask for. Mom and Dad, thank you for the support always and to our Marine Chem class of 2022. There's not much to say. I love you guys. Any questions? Yes. So we did not take samples near um, the bridge on Highway 16, and I'll, put that, uh, I'll pull up that map again of Snake Lake. Um, as you can see, there is a second bridge up by Highway 16, and that you're right, that would have been amazing to take samples from as it is under a highway overpass. Unfortunately, when we started taking samples in the summer, the lake was dry, so it was not, um, water was not flowing all the way through. So a consequence of that was when we went to take our first sample from the second bridge, there was no water underneath the bridge. So we connect, uh, collect samples. There is water under the bridge now, but because we started without taking it from there, we did not start midway through. And if I can just add something to that, um, that is an area that uh, underclassmen, if you're thinking about your projects, then that's a great thing that you could do in a project with Snake Lake. 
Um, and also in my uh, environmental science class, we did test, uh, do water samples from that second bridge. Uh, obviously not caffeine, we don't have access to the same instrument. But we did certain variables, uh, such as turbidity, other things that would determine water quality. And we did notice there were some uh, not so desirable uh, results in that. So I think that would definitely help prove our point with this study if we would have been able to have those samples. Uh, you made a <laughs> they were both our bus drivers, though, so that's why. Well, that uh, concludes our first evening of presentations. Uh, can we just go ahead and give one more round of applause for these guys? and their effort. Um, uh, I am open to